Thank you all for joining us this morning. Um, my name is Laurie Campbell. I'm the Executive Director of the Metastatic Breast Cancer Alliance on behalf of the Alliance. I want to welcome you to our webinar series. Today's webinar is titled Clinical Trials 101, and our guest speaker will be Dr. Aaron Cobain. Um, uh, at this point in the program, I would uh, I just want to talk about some of the logistics. Um, we're using the Zoom webinar feature. Um, so all attendees um, have entered in the muted mode. And um, we have an hour allocated. And the first 45, 50 minutes will be a, a presentation given by Dr. Cobain. And following that, we'll have 10 or 15 minutes of questions. And um, we're going to use the uh, raising the hand feature on Zoom for folks to uh, indicate that they have a question and then I'll be fielding the questions um, individually and I'll call your name to let you know that it's your time to ask a question. Um, so again, thank you all for joining us. Um, for the Alliance members that are on the call, uh, as many of you know, clinical trials is a big focus area for the Alliance in 2018. It was something that we talked about last fall. Um, so this kind of kicks off our clinical trial education awareness, and we're delighted to have Dr. Cobain with us. So thank you, Dr. Cobain. And Shirley, I will pass the baton to you so that you can um, introduce her. For I'm sure uh, many of you know Shirley. Um, she's the co-chair for the Research Task Force of the Alliance. She's also the president of the Metastatic Breast Cancer Network in um, Chicago. Um, she's very uh, active. Um, patient advocate in the community. And um, Shirley, I'm passing the baton to you. Thank you, Lori. Uh, I'm very pleased to um, speak with, uh, to take a moment to introduce Dr. Cobain. Uh, she is an oncologist at the University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Um, she is trained in uh, internal medicine as well as hematology and oncology. Uh, her uh, research work focuses on next generation sequencing technology, and she's most interested in determining if a uh, high mutational load among those with triple negative breast cancer means that they might be resistant to chemotherapy and more, uh, find more beneficial uh, immunotherapy uh, as an alternative. So she's an exciting uh, person, and uh, uh, I join Lori in welcoming her to uh, today's webinar. Dr. Cobain, I turn it to you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, really appreciate you all having me, and I, I look forward to talking with you today and um, answering any questions that, um, that folks may have about clinical trials. Um, I really just created this slide deck um, to be an introduction to clinical trials in general and how we approach this in the oncology clinic, and I hope through these slides will answer um, maybe a lot of the common questions, um, fears, misconceptions that patients have about participation in clinical trials. Just a very broad definition of, you know, what is a clinical trial. Um, really, this is just a research study that tests how well some kind of new medical intervention may work in people. And there's many different types of new medical interventions that can be studied in the context of a clinical trial. So these include maybe perhaps a new test that we would use to screen for a disease, um, such as an imaging test perhaps to detect cancer. Um, it could be a medication that we prescribe to prevent the development of a disease altogether, or at least to attempt to do that. And then, of course, a medication to treat an active disease, such as many of the clinical trials are, um, are done in uh, metastatic breast cancer. All right, you can move on to the next slide. Okay, so what are researchers really hoping to learn from a clinical trial that involves a new drug? So very common objectives that clinicians and researchers have are to establish whether or not a new drug that's under investigation is indeed safe for patients to take. Um, we also want to determine whether or not that new drug may be more effective or at least as effective as current standard therapies for that disease. 
and then also determine if that new drug is indeed less toxic, um, which we're always aiming to try and develop new therapies that result in less side effects and can have, um, you know, patients can maintain quality of life while on that treatment. Okay, next slide. Okay, so um, really, I think it's just important to kind of understand how concepts for clinical trials develop. So most clinical trials of a new drug really begin with research in a lab, where that drug is really first tested on cancer cells and in animal models. And so if we think that a new drug may be an effective cancer treatment, the very first step is, of course, not to test it in humans, but it really is studied oftentimes for many, many years in a research laboratory setting where it is really required that uh, an, a researcher demonstrate that cancer cells, that their growth can be inhibited by this drug, or that um, this can really even potentially shrink tumors that are in animal models. Okay, you can go to the next slide. Um, I think another really important thing to understand is that that there are three different types of clinical trials that we conduct in people, and um, they come in three different phases. So the earliest phase of clinical trial is called a phase one clinical trial. Oftentimes, major cancer centers have entire clinics that are dedicated to phase one clinical trial. So, for instance, patients that may have breast cancer, um, oftentimes the phase one clinical trials in breast cancer aren't run out of the breast cancer program. They actually may be run by a whole separate phase one or early therapeutics clinic. Um, this is because these are really first in human studies. And the primary objective is often not really to determine if the drug is effective, but just simply to determine if the drug is safe and also to establish what the, um, the best dose is of the drug. So I think patients oftentimes thinking about any clinical trial think about, you know, of course, the opportunity that this drug may, um, you know, inhibit the growth of their cancer or may improve their outcome. While that's certainly possible with a phase one clinical trial, I just think it's important to understand that that's not actually the question that the researchers are asking. They're really trying to determine, is this a drug that is even safe to give to people? If a phase one trial, um, a dose is able to be established that's clearly safe and well tolerated by patients, then the drug will often move on to a phase two trial. And um, in a phase two trial, the, the aim is really to try and determine if the drug is effective, but these aren't usually really very large studies. What researchers are looking for is a signal that this drug may have a positive impact on the disease that you're trying to, to treat. Um, some phase two studies are randomized, meaning that patients, you know, uh, that enter the study, half of them may receive the current standard treatment and half of them may receive this new experimental therapy. But some phase two trials are what we call single arm, which basically means that every patient who enters the trial is gonna get the new drug. And then the comparison is really to some kind of historical comparison from a previously conducted clinical trial of a current standard therapy. If a phase two trial shows a good signal that this drug may indeed be effective, then it moves on to a phase three clinical trial, which is really the most advanced and the largest of the clinical trials that are conducted. And essentially, a phase three clinical trial is almost always a randomized tri trial where the new drug is being compared to a current standard of care therapy um, to best understand you know, whether or not that drug is indeed more effective than the current standards. Okay, can move on to the next slide. Okay, I think also really helpful to understand just who the personnel are, um, the people that are involved in the operation of clinical trials. So the first thing to know about is that really the person who is running a clinical trial is what we refer to as the principal investigator. This is usually a physician that has developed um, the concept for the clinical trial. Um, you know, it may be that that physician is collaborating with the scientist 
scientists in the lab who initially tested the drug, and now they are the ones sort of bringing this clinical trial concept to the clinic to test it in 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 individuals. Um, there will often be co-investigators on the clinical trial, which are really physicians and um, nurse practitioners and physician assistants who can enroll patients onto a clinical trial but are not actually leading the study. So they're participants, um, but they're not, they're not really directing the operations of the trial. Um, clinic research coordinators um, are very involved and oftentimes communicate extensively with patients when you're participating in a clinical trial regarding all all of the testing that's required on the study. Um, they oftentimes manage the processes of informed consent when a patient actually agrees to participate. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. And then also coordinate all of the follow-up that a patient may need while they're on the study. I think it's also nice to know just sort of, you know, behind the scenes, what happens at the level um, of, you know, uh, really an academic medical center or a, a, a community oncology practice with regards to oversight of clinical trials. As a clinical trial is being developed and before it actually opens and is able to enroll patients at a clinical site, um, all clinical trials really have to receive approval by something that we call a protocol review committee or a PRC. This is really a group of physicians, nurses who are very familiar with clinical trial processes and they all sit on a board, they review the protocol extensively, um, they talk about the risks to patients, they talk about, um, you know, sort of the design of the trial and whether or not they think the investigators are likely to be able to answer the questions that they hope to accomplish through the study. And then the investigators get extensive feedback from that protocol review committee. And oftentimes, they actually request that changes are made to the clinical trial to make this optimal for both patients and the researchers trying to answer these questions. And then after it goes through the protocol review committee and those modifications are made, um, then the clinical trial actually gets reviewed by something we call the Institutional Review Board. Um, this is, again, another body of physicians, um, scientists, um, nursing staff, and it's a little bit broader on the Institutional Review Board. Oftentimes, so say this is a cancer clinical trial, the Institutional Review Board will oftentimes include members that aren't necessarily even involved in cancer cancer care, but can read through informed consent documents, make sure everything is understandable for patients, and um, really just try and advocate that this study is conducted as well and as safely as possible. And so sometimes even the Institutional Review Board then requests that changes are made in order to, to make this an optimal clinical trial. Once the clinical trial then gets up and running, anything unexpected or something that we call an adverse event um, that may occur to a patient while they are participating in a clinical trial actually gets reported and it's evaluated by a committee that we call the Data Safety Monitoring Board or the DSMB. So for instance, if a patient is participating in a clinical trial and while they're taking a new medication, they um, end up getting ill and requiring a stay in the hospital, that actually gets reviewed by the DSMB to try and determine, is this related to their participation in the clinical trial? Could this have been from a side effect of the drug? And is it safe to continue to enroll patients in this clinical trial um, based upon what happened to this individual patient? So everything gets reviewed really at an individual level. Okay, can move forward. Um, all physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants who are enrolling patients in a clinical trial really use what we call a protocol um, to um, really determine what the study procedures are. Um, there's oftentimes instructions in the protocol for how the medication should be dosed, um, the schedule of medications, the schedule of laboratory tests that a patient needs. And so this is really um, kind of the roadmap that the clinical staff use uh, during the clinical trial. Um, also contains just the objectives and the reason for doing the trial in the first place. It contains a very detailed description of the patient population um, that they're trying to recruit to the study, which we call the eligibility criteria, so intentionally determining which patients are eligible to participate. Um, it has a lot of detailed information about the statistics and how many individuals are needed to enroll in the clinical trial in order to answer the question at hand. 
Um, it talks about what medical tests will be done, how often, um, and what type of information will actually be collected about the patients that are taking part in the study. All right, next slide. So this is really the informed consent document is I think the document that is probably most important for patients. Um, when a patient may initially express interest in a clinical trial and discuss that with their oncologist, this is the document that a patient receives to learn more about the study. Um, it really outlines the risks and the potential benefits of participating. It describes which patients are eligible to participate, so understanding why an individual or why you might be eligible for this trial. Um, provides all the contact information for the research coordinator, actually the principal investigator of the study. This is the document that requires a patient's signature um, prior to them formally enrolling in the trial. So this is the document that states, I want to participate, I want to join this trial. And it's really important to note, I think all informed consent documents are pretty clear in stating that patient participation is completely voluntary. And just because you signed that informed consent document does not mean that you can't back out. Patients are allowed to back out of participation in a clinical trial at any time. So say for instance, a patient gets their first dose of the drug on the clinical trial and has significant side effects and wants to withdraw from the study, signing that document does not mean that there is any obligation to continue. Okay, next slide. Okay, so I think, you know, some of the questions um, that patients may ask is, you know, really, you know, who should consider participating in clinical trials? And I, and I just want to highlight that there's a myth that, especially in the oncology world, that clinical trials are really only for patients with very advanced cancer who are not responding to standard treatment. Um, that is not true. Um, we are conducting clinical trials among, um, you know, patients that have all stages of breast cancer. Um, and um, similarly, I think in, in, in other cancers as well. Um, and really, I think a clinical trial is worth considering at all phases of treatment. We always have opportunity to try and improve our standard therapies. Um, and you know, while sometimes our standard therapies may be quite good, I think most breast cancer doctors would agree that we're not at the point where our standard therapies were regardless of the stage of cancer, work for every individual patient. Um, we'd love for that to someday be the case. And so that's why we're really conducting clinical trials all the way along the spectrum. And it's not just something that is reserved for patients with advanced cancer that are no longer responding to the standard treatments. Okay, next slide. Okay, so where are clinical trials conducted and who actually runs them? So I've already touched on this a little bit, but most oncology clinics do participate in clinical trials, although some centers may have more trial options than others. So um, academic medical centers or large comprehensive cancer centers, like a place where I work, the University of Michigan, tends to have a lot of clinical trials largely because um, the, the cancer center really has a research mission um, that is an objective is to, um, is to try and continue to study cancer care and new therapies for patients with cancer. Um, that does not mean that clinical trials are not available in community practice. They certainly are and there are many community practices that have a lot of clinical trial options available. Um, clinical trials are usually sponsored by an entity and I want to talk, there's, there's more categories than this, but I think it's helpful to just kind of understand the three major categories. So um, some clinical trials are sponsored by what we call the cooperative groups, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a second. Um, and, and now, the cooperative groups are not really separate entities. They're really under the umbrella of the National Cancer Institute, which is um, really governed by the National Institutes of Health, the NIH. And so these are often very large clinical trials that are happening across the country and on occasion across the world and open at multiple cancer centers. So these are often extremely large studies um, that, that we're trying to recruit many patients to and, and study across institutions. 
There are other clinical trials that are sponsored uh, predominantly by the pharmaceutical industry. Oftentimes, what the pharmaceutical industry will do is they will, you know, have a new drug that they hope to investigate, um, design a clinical trial, and then find institutions or oncology practices that are willing to partner and participate with them in order to conduct this clinical trial in the clinic. Um, so this is really a, you know, a drug company sponsored clinical trial. Um, there's also what we call investigator initiated trials. And while these can be larger studies, oftentimes these are the smaller studies. Um, and maybe these are even drugs that have been developed in a researcher's laboratory. Um, so not all cancer drugs come from the pharmaceutical industry. Sometimes they are actually developed in um, research labs and academic medical centers. And it might be that a researcher then wants to move forward and study their drug um, in a trial in sort of what we call a pilot study at their individual institution. So uh, those are, I think, kind of the three big categories of how clinical trials get up and running and who they're sponsored by. All right, next slide. All right, so I want to talk a little bit more about the cooperative groups and something that we call the National Clinical Trials Network. So what you can see here in this diagram, um, um, all of these kind of navy blue circles represent a cooperative group. And essentially what that means is that there are academic and community oncology practices that have agreed to all be a part of a consortium such that if a clinical trial is run through that consortium, every institution that is a part of that has access to that clinical trial and has ability to enroll patients on that clinical trial. So it's essentially multiple institutions and oncology practices joining forces so that they can run a really large study and have this trial reach a large number of patients. Several years ago, it was recognized that these cooperative groups kind of functioning as separate entities was really not the ideal structure. And I think the, the main reason for that is, is that, you know, oftentimes, say, investigators in SWOG um, might have a similar idea to investigators in the ECOG Akron, Akron cooperative group. And so there might be two really similar clinical trials um, utilizing, obviously, a large number of resources because these studies are often quite massive, and we didn't want two of the same clinical trial kind of running in competition with each other. And so um, the uh, National Clinical Trials Network essentially formed, which is under the direction of the National Cancer Institute, to essentially bring these cooperative groups together so that when a trial concept is originally discussed at the level of the cooperative group, it then has to undergo a second step of approval where it becomes an NCTN-sponsored clinical trial, and it just ensures then that all of the cooperative groups have access to that clinical trial and that there aren't multiple studies that are in direct competition with that trial um, so that we can really try and invest the maximum amount of resources to answer that, you know, that question at hand. So, for instance, now, if a clinical trial concept is developed in SWOG, gets approved at the level of the NCTN, um, actually every single cooperative group, so ECOG Akron, Alliance, NRG, all have access to that trial. It doesn't just stay within that cooperative group. Okay, next slide. Okay, and then uh, also important to understand that within the National Clinical Trials Network, there are 30 um, comprehensive cancer centers across the country that have been designated as the NCTN lead academic participating sites. They call these sites LAPS sites. And, um, Basically, these are the comprehensive cancer centers across the country that probably accrue the largest number of patients to participate in a clinical trial um, of any center across the country. So as I mentioned, there's currently 30 of them. They're generally academic medical centers that have hematology oncology fellowship training programs. Um, and you know, they're, they're just kind of the, the lead participators because they're involving the largest number of patients. Next slide. 
Okay, so now I want to come back, uh, now that we sort of understand how a clinical trial can get up and running and who oversees it and who may sponsor the clinical trial, just want to get to some questions that I think a lot of patients um, certainly ask me as they're thinking about um, enrolling in a trial, which is sort of these general questions, you know, is participating in a clinical trial safe? And I think the other question that I'd like to address is um, a lot of patients have this concern about uh, receiving placebo or a treatment that is not an active therapy. Um, so we've already talked about that clinical trials have a tremendous degree of oversight to ensure that they are conducted as safely as possible. This is at the level of the Institutional Review Board, the Protocol Review Committee, the Data Safety Monitoring Board, and for trials that are really large, like a cooperative group study, includes the oversight of committees within the cooperative group, um, then the NCTN under the direction of the National Cancer Institute. So if a safety issue um, you know, is identified and is recurrent within a clinical trial, oftentimes the protocol is revised real time. Um, so if we find that you know, the same thing is happening to multiple patients that are taking this drug, um, and we may need to say reduce the dose of a drug in order to avoid that side effect, the protocol actually can be modified real time. And so that oftentimes happens in the form of what we call an amendment. Um, so some Sometimes the data safety monitoring board will come back to us and say, you know what, we've had too many patients that have ended up in the hospital from taking this drug. Um, we're going to need to lower the dose and we're going to have to stop enrollment until we can amend the protocol to reflect the following modification. So um, while it's not a guarantee that taking an investigational drug is safe, um, I think there are a lot of processes in place to try and make sure that this is done as safely and as cautiously as possible. Um, I think in terms of a placebo, these are this is really often incorporated into study where the standard of care really involves no additional recommended treatment. So in terms of patients with stage four or metastatic cancer, it's really exceptionally rare that we do placebo-controlled studies because um, patients with particularly metastatic breast cancer, um, typically uh, are, you know, on treatment indefinitely. And so while it is possible that, you know, enrolling in a clinical trial, you, you know, may not get an investigational drug, you may get a current standard of care drug, um, it, it is very, very rare that in the setting of stage four cancer, patients are randomly assigned to receive a placebo. Um, when, uh, you know, there's, there's currently no treatment that is standard of care, um, then, then that's where that sort of may, may come into play. All right, next slide. Okay, so things to consider, I think, um, as a patient before agreeing to participate in a clinical trial. So um, I think one of the main things to consider is that the alternative to participating in a clinical trial is receiving standard therapy. And so I think it's important to talk to your doctor about the risks and the potential benefits of just really the standard treatment options. Um, you know, while um, the experimental therapy may not have all the risks and the potential benefits well understood, um, I think it is important to understand the limited information that is available. Probably the potential risks and benefits are least well understood for a phase one clinical trial, where this is the first time we're studying this in humans. However, for a phase three clinical trial, oftentimes there is a lot of safety data that has already been accumulated from phase one and phase two clinical trials previously conducted. And so I think sometimes entering a phase three clinical trial, patients can have a pretty good understanding um, of what the risks are of taking this drug. I think it's also just, to, you know, important to have the, the input of, of your oncologist um, and kind of understand whether or not from a timing perspective, um, they think it's, it's a good time to participate in a clinical trial. I think the other things to kind of be aware of, because our clinical trials are, the, the landscape is really changing. You know, it used to be that the majority of clinical trials we conducted in patients with metastatic cancer was just, you know, taking, for instance, anybody with a diagnosis of triple negative breast cancer and testing this new drug. Now that we really have the tools to uncover the differences um, and individual individual characteristics of a patient's um, cancer, which may be different from somebody else's with triple negative breast cancer, a lot of the clinical trials we're doing are using what we call a biomarker um, to select patients that we think, at least 
from our studies in the laboratory are most likely to benefit from a treatment. So for instance, if a cancer is sequenced and found to have a certain mutation, um, it may be that that clinical trial is only recruiting patients with X mutation because we think that they're more likely to benefit from the drug. Um, I think the other important thing to consider is just the logistical aspects, um, the convenience of the treatment schedule. You know, sometimes clinical trials require patients to come into the office upwards of, you know, once a week, um, and I know that can be incredibly taxing. And then also how far um, one is traveling um, for a clinical trial. Sometimes a really wonderful clinical trial option may be available across the country. And I think that's something that I know a lot of my patients consider is whether or not um, they're willing to uh, travel, you know, to a, to a different location and if that's feasible for them in order to participate. Next slide. Okay, so what to do if your oncologist maybe hasn't, hasn't mentioned clinical trials. So I think the first thing to do is simply to just ask. Um, and I think, you know, very basic questions that one could ask is, um, you know, does the clinic actually have clinical trials open currently? I think for the majority of oncology practices, the answer is yes to this. But as we mentioned earlier, I think some um, oncology clinics will have more uh, trials open than others. Um, are there any clinical trials that you may qualify for currently? Um, or if you don't qualify for them now, are there clinical trials that you and your doctor may want to be keeping in mind um, for the future? And if your oncologist were to tell you, you know what, we really don't have anything right now that I can see being a good fit for you, I think the next logical question to ask, particularly if you're interested in participating, is are there other centers that may have clinical trials available? Are there other centers in my area? Are there other centers, um, you know, further away? Way if, if travel is something that is feasible. Okay, next slide. Um, and other thing I, I think that's important also for patients to know about is just how one can search for clinical trials on their own. So, you know, while I think oncologists can absolutely be a wonderful resource. If you are interested in just getting online, I wanted to make sure you are aware of um, some, you know, sort of trusted uh, sources for looking at clinical trials. So the first here, I've, I've listed the website for um, the National Cancer Institute sponsored clinical trials. So this is really um, the, the trials that are run by the, by the cooperative groups and the NCTN, so the large scale trials that are available across the country. Um, um, and these are all trials that are funded by the National Cancer Institute. So these are these are research questions that I think um, you know the, the uh, leaders at the National Cancer Institute feel are incredibly important um, to answer. So you can type in a cancer type, a keyword, um, how old you are, where you know what your zip code is, so that it can pop up with a list of trials that are are in your area. Okay, next slide. And then the other much more broad um, search, and I think this one is a little bit more challenging for patients to use simply because it, it returns a large, a large number of results, is clinicaltrials.gov. Really, any clinical trial across the country, be it a cooperative group study sponsored by the National Clinical Trials Network, a pharmaceutical uh, company sponsored trial, or even very small investigator initiated trials that are only open at one center um, are registered on clinicaltrials.gov. Um, so, you know, again, similarly, you can type in a disease type, you can type in other keywords. So say, for instance, the disease type is breast cancer, you could type in triple negative under other terms. You can, of course, designate, you know, the United States, and then you can search this. And, um, it is going to return with a large list of possible trials. Um, I think sometimes this, this site can be a bit overwhelming just because it, 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 it returns a lot of information, but if you want the most comprehensive approach, I think this, this website is incredibly helpful. Okay, next slide. Okay, other questions we get asked a lot from patients are whether or not uh, participating in a clinical trial will actually cost money. Um, generally, participation in a clinical trial does not cost the patient any additional money. So the investigational drug, the study-related testing and procedures are often all paid for by the study sponsor. So if this is a trial sponsored by the National Cancer Institute, they are funding all of the procedures on the study. 
if there are components of the trial that involve the way we would treat a patient anyway, so what we call standard of care procedures, so say for instance getting CT scans or bone scans, um, oftentimes those things, even for patients that are participating in a clinical trial, is just simply billed to their insurance company. So the actual, um, you know, just logistical day-to-day -day aspects of a clinical trial should not cost any additional money beyond um, the, the standard care that, that one would receive in an oncology clinic. I think the exception to this is just the decision to travel to participate in a clinical trial. Um, oftentimes, a study, of course, cannot cover, um, you know, costs of a plane ride or a long car drive um, to, to, to go to another center to participate in a study that may be farther away from you. However, there are some studies that actually actually recognize that um you know, transportation is an issue for major for, for, for many patients, and they do actually provide sometimes some reimbursement for travel costs. So I bring this up only because I think it's important to ask. Um, but I, I, in general, travel costs are uh, are not you know completely reimbursed. Okay, next slide. So I think that was all of the, the content that I wanted to cover, and I hope I um, addressed um, many of the questions. And so I think I'll just stop there and see if, um, if there are questions that, that people have that I could be helpful with. Great. Thank you very much, Dr. Gobain. Um, there have been a couple of questions that um, came up while you're giving your presentation. So um, I'd like to start with those, but also invite people that have questions to raise their hand and I can see that a couple of you um, are doing that already. So Joan Mancuso, I'll start with you. Joan, go ahead. Joan. Okay. Well, Joan's question. Um, Joan is actually, same. I'm sorry, she's on an older version of Zoom and cannot um, talk. Okay. So, we'll have to so <laughs> her question was, how does the TPCRC, the Translational Breast Cancer Research Consortium, fit into the NCTN? Yes. So um, that's a great question. The, the um, TBCRC is actually a separate entity, so they are really not governed by the NCTN um, the way that the cooperative groups are. But it's a very similar philosophy, which is that you know multiple institutions joining together um, to try and run clinical trials so that it has the opportunity to reach a larger number of patients. So. Um, uh, and the TBCRC really focuses, I mean, it's, it's the, in the title, it's the Translational Breast Cancer Research Consortium. And so what the, the buzzword translational kind of indicates is that their really objective is to try and take concepts that developed in the laboratory and then move them into the clinic. So this is what you might hear of as people describe of bench to bedside kind of research. And so um, it, it, it is a similar in concept, but it isn't really direct, it's not considered a cooperative group in the same way that um, the others are that are under the umbrella of the NCTN. It's kind of a standalone entity. Great. Thank you for that. Um, I'm going to read a couple of other questions that came in. Um, uh, would you have any suggestions for a place to look for clinical trials for our global patients? That is a great question. Um, you know, one thing I will say about many of the um, cooperative groups in the NCTN sponsored clinical trials is that they have um, started to work with centers um, outside the United States. Um, so, for instance, I know that um, SWOG, because that's the cooperative group that I'm a part of, has a Latin America um, connection. And so there is now a great effort um, to open a lot of the SWOG NCTN sponsored clinical trials. Um, in in Latin America, so um, that is an effort that is that is happening at the level of the NCI. In terms of a, a search um, for for other resources, I don't actually know off of the top of my head, but I could certainly try and find that out and get back to you with with some more information that might be helpful. Great, thank you for that. Um, uh, another question. Um, we have found that in most cases, our male breast cancer patients may or may not be accepted into clinical trials for breast cancer. 
given the number of men with breast cancer is lower than women, unfortunately, a separate trial for just men looks to be next to impossible given the low numbers. Having said that, and given the fact that men are being treated uh, like when presenting a breast cancer diagnosis, wouldn't it make sense to include them in all breast cancer trials? Yeah, I think this is a, a great point. And um, I know that there is an increasing effort to ensure that men are indeed included in breast cancer clinical trials. Um, and uh, and I, I completely understand that, you know, historically that has that has not always always been the case. Um, you know, we think that the biology of, of male breast cancer is probably similar um, in many respects to the biology of female breast cancer and absolutely right that men are uh, treated with really the same therapies that, that female breast cancer is. And so I agree with the sentiment and um, I think that uh, provided there is not a um, clear reason um, with regards to the research question why the you know biology of male breast cancer may not be benefited by a new drug or, or a new treatment that including men um, with breast cancer in clinical trials is incredibly important. Great. Next question. Um, patients are often concerned about the costs of clinical trials um, regarding uh, a second part of that is um, regarding inform informed consent. What about potential costs of a trial to a patient? Do you think that costs should be standardized and mandatory for inclusion and in informed consent as appropriate? So as I mentioned, usually participation in a clinical trial um, does not cost the patient any additional money beyond what it would be for, per, you know, essentially receiving standard of care therapy. And that's because the costs of the clinical trial and study related procedures that are outside the standard of care are often covered by the study sponsor. I think the exception to that is transportation costs when somebody chooses to participate in a clinical trial that may be far away from their home. Um, and that's, um, you know, certainly still um, still a challenge for major, for, uh, for many patients. And I think, you know, many people may not participate in a trial when it's only available at a site that's, you know, four or five hours drive away from them. Um, but in general, participating in a clinical trial does not, does not cost a patient um, in, uh, you know, additional money. Um, in terms of being transparent about the costs of a clinical trial in general, um, uh, you know, it oftentimes is not included on the informed consent document, and that's simply because the, the patient is in general not held directly responsible for those costs. Um, but uh, certainly, I think if a patient were to inquire, um, it's oftentimes, you know, publicly available information to understand what the budget is of a clinical trial and how much it costs at sort of a um, more broad level. Yeah, and I think that's a challenge for many of the patients just in terms of the answer, answer really costs that, that come up. Um, a follow-up question is what percentage of the clinical trials that, that you, Dr. Cobain, you work with cover transportation? Is it a small percentage, a large percentage? It's probably a small percentage. Um, yeah, I, I think um, this is a this is a major barrier. And um, you know, when we tell a patient here in Michigan that there's a clinical trial available, but it's in Boston um, or it's in New York or it's in California, that's oftentimes not a not a reasonable or feasible thing for for a patient and their family to do and coordinate. Um, so I think this is a this is a major issue, um, but transportation can be quite costly. Um, and I, uh, I I'd say the majority of the clinical trials that that we work with do not cover transportation costs. Some do, um, and but usually it's kind of a small amount of comp compensation, not reimbursing all of the transportation costs. Um, next question: um, Have you? or has there been an, an increase in diversity of patients with the, the newer NCTN model? That's a great question. Um, I have not seen the data on whether or not we have a more diverse patient population with the NCTN model. Um, I think you could speculate that the answer to that question may be yes, um, only because now with the NCTN model, the clinical trials developed at the level of any cooperative group are now avail you know, can be, in theory, available um, across the country. Um, but I have not actually seen that that data as to whether or not we, you know, the diversity has improved as a result of the NCTN model. 
Um, another question is, um, why is patient participation in clinical trials in Europe must, much higher than the, U, the United States? What are they doing differently to recruit patients and what could we learn from them? Yeah, so um, that's a really great question. Um, I will be honest that I have very, I, I, I don't have any experience with the clinical trial processes in Europe. Um, I, I do think that one of the reasons why we struggle a little bit um, in, in, uh, in recruiting patients to, to participate in clinical trials is also one of the reasons that uh, is, is sort of an advantage was that you know we try and do this in a really safe and thoughtful way. Um, I think I showed you a long list of committees that these clinical trials need to go through in order for them to be approved and then ultimately opened and um, accruing patients. Um, just to give you a little bit of a flavor and an idea, I'm working. I've been working on a clinical trial that is not yet open um, and is in the process of going through various stages and committees for about the past three years. Um, so I think one of the challenges that we have here is that the the timeline for opening a study is is oftentimes quite quite lengthy, um, and um, one of the concerns about when that timeline is lengthy is that is the therapy then you know, kind of no longer relevant by the time, you know, three to four years has elapsed and we get a trial ready to get up and running. Um, so I think that's one of the challenges that we have. Um, I, but I also think I, I can see the flip side of it, which is that you know the, the the regulatory aspect is is meant to be in place um, to make sure these these are done in the in the safest way possible. And I think one of the things that we could potentially learn from them is how to expedite our processes in a in a safe way. Um, and I think that's if you know that's probably the major thing that that we need to work on. Great, Shirley uh, Mertz. I see that you have your hand raised. Um, go ahead and ask your question. Uh, thank you. And Dr. Cobain, I just. Your presentation was great, very clear, but moving on. Um, oftentimes, as you noted, the patients begin with standard care, and sometimes either after they've had standard care a while, or unfortunately, in times when they've exhausted all of the standard care, they then look for a clinical trial that they might be eligible for. And unfortunately, a frustration of many, many metastatic breast cancer patients is that they find that they are ineligible for trials because they either had, quote, too many lines of chemotherapy or they maybe took a drug, uh, sometimes an oral drug uh, in the past, but that because that oral drug is now being used in a clinical trial, um, they're, they're told they're ineligible. So yes. would, uh, would oncologists ever consider allowing such patients who've exhausted standard care to be enrolled maybe in a separate arm of the trial or, or just allowed to participate where their results could be followed um, because it's really exasperating um, that you did what you thought was right, follow standard care, and now you're excluded from trials. Yeah. I, I can completely understand that, and I and I think um, you know you sort of touch on this balance of um, identifying a population of patients that clearly sort of meets the research objective, so that the clinical question can be answered most reliably, and then sort of the practical consideration, which is that if we make the eligibility criteria so strict, um, we're going to have a large population of patients who who cannot participate. Um, I think there's you know sort of two ways that I would think about this. I think the, the first way that, that I, I think you know is important to kind of uh, approach this issue is is again to sort of um, get rid of this myth that clinical trials are only really meant to be considered at late stages of disease. I actually think the earlier that sometimes patients are treated with with therapies, you know, maybe the greatest potential, um, you know, for for benefit of those therapies. And I think it's something that patients and physicians alike need to be thinking of from the very get go, especially you know when somebody's even diagnosed very early on um, with their metastatic breast cancer, and not be waiting until the fifth, sixth, seventh line chemotherapy to be to be thinking of this. 
Um, I think the other aspect is I completely agree with your sentiment that I think researchers need to consider how they can keep trials available to a broad as possible, um, you know, broad enough population um, as is feasible without compromising the research question. Um, and I think oftentimes there are ways that that we could um, make it more broadly applicable. So as you suggested, you know, designing another study arm that doesn't, you know, sort of, uh, it, they're, they're not all put in the same pool um, so that we can sort of analyze the results separately. The practical concern with that is just simply that, you know, that increases, of course, the sample size of the trial and then um, oftentimes, you know, when you're reliant upon external sources of funding, um, you know, you have to sort of take into account those, those logistical considerations. But um, I, I think as researchers, it, it really is on us um, to think about the ways that, you know, with every trial that we develop, how can we make this um, applicable for the largest number of patients within reason that will still allow the research question to be answered? Because the last thing we want to do is conduct a clinical trial, um, you know, allow everyone to participate, and that because the participants in the clinical trial are so diverse and unique that we can't actually answer a question. Um, and because then the clinical trial is, is not helpful and, and it doesn't allow us to advance forward the field. But I, but I absolutely understand what you're saying and I think, I think we need to strike that balance better. Great. Thank you for that. Shirley, I see you have another question. Yes. Um, one of the concerns that patients often have when they uh, get to the point where they want to join a trial is that they feel that they're scans or other diagnostics that they had at their local hospital cannot be used by the trial site. If the trial site wants to do its own scans or even maybe get another uh, tissue biopsy. And, and this right. again is very exasperating to the patient and their family. Um, can you maybe explain why this has to be done? Uh, you Absolutely. Know, you think one hospital would respect another hospital's uh, work, uh, and, and is there any way around this? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, this is um, oftentimes a real frustration for us as physicians too, and I think, you know, one of the major challenges that we we have in our country is that our, our medical record systems don't talk. <laughs> um, so I think that's getting getting better, um, but it's sort of slowly getting better. And sort of the way that, uh, you know, a lot of the medical record systems have, have developed is that, um, you know, I, they're, they're all sort of these separate silos. And so if there's a scan done at another hospital, it's not always easy to access or see when you come to another center and are considering clinical trial. Um, I think one of the things that physicians oftentimes forget to write into a protocol, which I think is something we could improve upon, is that if a patient has had a scan at another hospital, really what's needed is that you just need access to the images. And so if they were to write into the protocol, that if a CD or a disc could be sent such that they can be uploaded and then the radiologists at the clinical trial center can review them, um, I think that's something that could be kind of a way around this. Um, and I, I think that sometimes we just sort of forget to write those logistics into the protocol. But oftentimes we need the radiologist at the participating center, or even sometimes it's a centralized radiologist to actually read and interpret the scan. So it can't just be that a paper report from another institution is, is adequate. You need the, the radiologist kind of participating in the study um, to review the scan. And, and this is one way that, again, we keep consistency within a, within a clinical trial to ensure that every patient is approached in the same way. Um, with regards to the biopsies, I, I think now increasingly clinical trials are, especially clinical trials in metastatic breast cancer, are incorporating tissue biopsies. And I think one of the reasons that we as researchers are recognizing that that may be very important is because the cancer, when it started, um, you know, if you were to take an old sample of the tumor from when somebody had their original breast cancer diagnosis and do tumor sequencing on it and all kinds of testing in the lab, and then you were to take a biopsy of when they developed stage four disease, perhaps even seven, 10, 15 years later, and do sequencing and all kinds of testing on the tumor, um, you find that it actually does not look 
identical. It doesn't look the same. There are features that are preserved, but there are also features that are different. Um, the tumor learns how to grow despite therapies. It, 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 it acquires these resistance mechanisms to drugs. And so one of the reasons that getting a brand new biopsy from a research perspective is helpful is it, it really is a real-time assessment. And I think our concern is, is that using old tissue that's from three, four, five years ago is not really a real-time assessment of the tumor. We know that it's dynamic. We know that it's changing. I think our way around this in the future is to really develop the technology of what we call liquid biopsies, which is the idea of using a blood sample to isolate things like circulating tumor DNA and circulating tumor cells. And um, while that technology is rapidly evolving, it is not yet something that I think we feel confident in considering standard of care um, in terms of, you know, can we really accurately assess the state of a tumor via a liquid biopsy? Um, I think we all have tremendous hope that we are going to get there, perhaps with, even within the next few years, um, because we recognize that undergoing a biopsy and a procedure is challenging for patients, and if we could do it by a simple blood draw, it would be a much preferred mechanism. Um, guys, we are almost to our hour of time. Um, Shirley, did you want to ask one last question? No, I, I think I uh, exhausted mine. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, listen, there are a couple of questions that didn't get answered that um, Dr. Cobain, we will forward to you so that we could um, get the answers back to those people that um, had asked the question. But um, I would like to thank you, Dr. Cobain, for your time today and all of you that attended today's webinar. I hope you found the session to be informative and helpful. Um, please feel free to share the recording of the webinar, which will be available um, tomorrow on the NBC Alliance website with your fellow um, members, patient advocates, and friends via social media. Um, uh, we, I just also wanted to close to let you know that the next Alliance um, webinar, uh, if you wanna save the date, is Wednesday, April 25th, and it's from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Um, Mary Lou Smith from RAN will um, be presenting the results of the uh, clinical trial endpoint survey that RAN did um, uh, as a result of uh, surveys from 500 metastatic breast cancer patients. Um, and we also next up have uh, Ellie Cohen um, from bct.org and UCSF, and she's gonna be um, doing a session on metastatic trial search and metastatic trial talk. Um, I know we talked a little bit earlier in terms of tools that you, you, you can use to find um, clinical trials that are relevant for MBC patients. So I wanted to just let you know that that also is scheduled um, later in the spring. So with that, I will close. Uh, once again, thanks to um, Dr. Gobain and um, everyone that attended today's session. Have a great day and thank you for joining us. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you.